Coming up next on The Voice of Alabama Politics, Trump triumphant. Also, what does this mean for Britt and Tuberville? And our rural hospitals in Alabama are in some big trouble. This woman has to be gotten to a hospital. A hospital? What is it? It's a big building with patients. I hope that's not the rescue squad. If so, we're really in trouble. All this said much, much more coming up next on The V. Welcome to the voice of Alabama politics, where we tackle the tough issues so you have the hard facts. I'm your host, Bill Britt, and as always, I'm joined by Susan Britt, research guru extraordinaire, and Josh Moon, investigative reporter and columnist at APR. Welcome. Hi, guys. Hey, y'all. I want to take a minute to congratulate President Donald Trump and Vice President J.D. Vance on their historic win. May God bless America, and you have great success in your administration. Now on to Alabama politics. There was a historic win here in Alabama where Shomari Figures won the congressional seat in District 2. Susan, it was historic. There are now two black uh, representatives in Congress from Alabama. Yes, and Shomari is a, a unique figure in that he comes from good stock. Uh, his father, Michael, and his mother, Vivian, Vivian, who's a friend of mine, I uh, have are some of the most hardworking people in Alabama politics that I've ever seen. And I know that Shamari is going to do the same thing in Washington. Yeah, Shamari's father passed away some years ago, mm -hmm. unfortunately, but I'm certain that he would be extremely proud of his son. Josh, you've, you've written quite a bit about Shamari Figures and his family. Give us a little insight. Yeah, I think that that's exactly right. Uh, I think his father would be extremely proud of the uh, the pathway that Shamari has taken. Um, you know, it it was a it was a historic win, and it was a, it was a good win. Uh, it's a win that uh, that the Democrats needed nationally as well. Uh, I think it'll uh, it, it may actually decide control of of Congress at this point. Um, and so, you know, it, it was it was very important all the way around uh, for everyone, and and it's. Important for Alabama because we're going to send a, a really decent guy uh, to to Congress, a guy that is familiar with that district down there. You listen to Shamari talk, and he talks about topics and issues uh, and plights of the people that are, have have historically not been paid much attention to. Uh, you know, with their representation over the last twenty or so years in that district, and so I, I think it's it's extremely important. And, and congratulations to him; uh, it, it is well deserved. They worked hard in the campaign, and and I'm proud that. Uh, we, we now have uh, two really, really great U.S. reps going uh, into Congress and Terry Sewell and, and Shamari Figgins. And all the incumbents, uh, one, all the incumbent Republicans uh, mm -hmm. have gone back uh, to the House. And, to, of course, we didn't have any Senate races. But uh, I think one of the interesting things is Republicans did flip uh, the U.S. Senate, mm -hmm. which uh, that may have profound meaning for Senator Tuberville mm -hmm. and Katie Britt. Uh, we know that there have been talk about Tommy Tuberville joining the Trump administration. Mm -hmm. uh, of course, Katie Britt will be uh, in a prime position uh, as she is a rising star in the Republican Party. What, what do you what do you think about that, Susan? I think pretty much uh, uh, President Trump has, you know, already made a promises to Tommy Tuberville long before all of this about a, a place in his cabinet or somewhere in the administration. Uh, I think that's pretty much you can, that's a go-to, that's, that's a closed deal. Uh, Katie Britt, I think, is going to start running circles around everybody. She's already doing it up there now, and with them having the majority, it gives her even more room to become a rising star. Josh, I know you don't think too much of uh, this Republican uh, having a majority in the Senate. Uh, it could be good for Alabama in some ways, uh, even if it's terrible for the country in your mind. 
right? <laughs> well, yeah, I, I suppose so. I mean, it'll be interesting to see what happens with the uh, Space Force uh, deal and, and whether or not that thing gets moved around yet again uh, and land, ends up landing back in Huntsville. I, I Honestly, I kind of believe I've disagreed with the Biden administration over, over the placement of that. Um, and and I, I felt like it did, did belong in Huntsville all along if we just have the uh, infrastructure here. And plus, for, for those of us who own houses, we would really welcome in more people because it's a really depressed economic area up here. Yeah. <laughs> it's terrible. And Madison. And so, you know, bring them on in, bring them on in. Yeah. But no, it's, uh, you know, I, I don't know. I don't know about Tommy Tuberville. I don't, I, you know, I've heard rumblings that, uh, that he will not uh, take a position in that administration right. just because I don't think he wants to be in D.C. Uh, for, for, you know, any extended period of time. And taking a position in the cabinet typically means you're going to end up around there. But uh, for Katie Britt, yeah, I think this opens up some uh, some committees and some other uh, chairmanship opportunities in, in certain places uh, for her to, to continue to grow. Uh, she's already already running circles around the senior senator from the from this state as it is. And, uh, you know, in terms of getting money and bringing it in, just like her predecessor. And so hopefully she'll keep that up. Well, I think, uh, you know, this is my personal opinion. I have to be very fond of Katie Britt, not only as an individual, but as a a uh, somebody that represents our state. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I think that if Tuberville took a position in the administration, it, you know, it would open up a door for uh, Governor Ivey to appoint uh, someone to go there. And there's mm -hmm. any number of candidates. I mean, I wouldn't mind seeing Steve Marshall go to the Senate as yeah, junior. out of Alabama. Well. <laughs> I mean, it's, sometimes that's how it works. No, right? I do agree with you. I'm being, I'm being. I, I think he would do a, a, better, job would do a better job there yeah. than he does here. I would agree. Uh, I think that's he, more he, his style. He wants a place in office, and uh, of course, he has done everything he can to show warmth and affection to the uh, president elect. And uh, I think he would would, I, and I mean that sincerely. And yes, <laughs> I would like to see him gone from Alabama, but in a, if he's got political ambitions, but in a place actually where he will do some good rather than here, where all he does is send out letters ch challenging the uh, current administration. I don't know what he's going to do when the Trump administration is in, because he'll have no one to send nasty letters to. No. <laughs> but no, I do, true, I, Josh, I, right? I do agree with you. I do agree with you on that. I think that that would be an opportunity for him where he could actually use his political talents there, and he and Katie could work together for bettering the state. Yeah, and she can keep him under control. That's true. Uh, which would be good. <laughs> so, you know, she. Well, you know, I look forward to the letter saying uh, how, how he's joined a 30-state uh, coalition uh, backing President Trump doing something. You know, I mean, it's, it's you know, it, we've, We've been opposed and playing defense for for a while now, so maybe maybe on, on offense. I don't I don't know exactly how those letters look, but yeah, uh, you know. I, but yeah, no, I think you're right. I think I, honestly, I do I do believe that, that Steve Marshall would would be a, a better senator than he has been in AG. Yeah, because he really hasn't done anything as AG. He no. won't prosecute any. And, I mean, they, he has to hold hands with the feds to basically do anything of worthwhile, and. Of course, and again, all the letters and all the rhetoric, and and he goes to every meeting he can go to to try to spotlight himself. So, and then he would it could be good, you know. Uh, Teddy Roosevelt was uh, sent to be vice president of the United States because they wanted to get him out of New York, and they thought if he sees a good place, same thing with Steve Marshall. But we're gonna have to leave it right there. You're watching the V, the voice of Alabama politics. We'll be right back. is one of the biggest factors in a fatal car crash. Your car stops, but your body does not stop at the same time. Your body keeps going, you know, and that could be running into your seat belt, that could be hitting the airbag, something has to stop it, and unfortunately, it's something very hard. There have been times that we've come upon accidents where if people weren't speeding, they'd probably still be alive today. It's truly dangerous, and it puts everybody at risk. There's just no point to it. This kind of stuff has got to stop. Your home is your most valuable asset. But what if someone tried to steal it from you? Property fraud is one of the fastest growing areas of fraud in the country today. As a district attorney, I've seen firsthand the devastating effects of property fraud. That's why I'm proud to support the Montgomery County Probate Court's REACT program. REACT is designed to protect your property and to give you peace of mind. By signing up, you'll receive an email notification 
if a document is filed against your property. This program is a game changer. It has the potential to prevent fraud and protect countless homeowners throughout Montgomery County. So don't wait. Sign up for REACT today and protect your home. Protect your home with REACT. Sign up today. Welcome back to The V, the voice of Alabama politics. You know, I, I uh, wrote a piece the other day about how rural hospitals in Alabama and around the nation are in serious trouble. Here in Alabama, we have had 14 hospitals close. There are 19 more that are in serious threat of being closed. And there, there's, there is a pathway to keep them open. And, and part of that runs through the ACA. But I know that lawmakers now are going to say, well, President Trump is going to you know, make changes to the ACA uh, so that, uh, that they're not going to be able to get rid of it. It's too no. popular to get rid it's of it. It's too complicated. Together. And it's a very complicated program. What they can do, though, is make adjustments. So one of the adjustments that we read about coming out of D.C., is they are going to uh, make it a little bit more fair. Where, say, a state like California now gets the same reimbursement as every other state, Arkansas, Missouri, any, mm -hmm. any place that has it. Uh, it would make it fairer for the states that are poorer. Mm -hmm. So they would get more allotment of federal funds whereas the larger states would get fewer dollars. And it would make it easier for places like Alabama to expand and save our rural hospitals. Mm -hmm. there, are, there are some serious conservative plans out there to do these types of things as well as other, other things that are, they do not look radical. They do not look drastic at this point. Now, will those be the one that get implemented? We don't know. I don't know, but I know right now we're looking at 50% of the rural hospitals are operating at a loss this year, up from 43% last year. And what they're being driven to have to do to cut their costs is stuff like not being able to provide chemotherapy or obstetrics, uh, which means that people are having to drive, you know, miles and miles and, and money out of pocket for gas and time and all of that. So something has to be done to try to help these rural hospitals. And I hope maybe that We've got some help coming. We'll see. Uh, Josh, I mean, uh, these are not only large economic engines in their communities, in these rural communities, but they provide mm -hmm. life-saving health care for the rural community. Uh, and I, I don't see how our lawmakers can stand there and say they are thoughtful and care about people and not do something to address this crisis. Well, listen, uh, you know, they have concepts of a plan on how to on how to get rid of uh, some of this. Uh, listen, it, it's. I, I don't understand what we're why we're still talking about some of this stuff in terms of the ACA. You, you, it's clear at this point. Uh, how long can you sell this? Uh, oh, well, we're going to get rid of Obamacare nonsense when you clearly don't have an option to to replace right. it in any meaningful way. Right. You, you don't. Okay, because it is as it's turned out. It was a pretty good program to address the the needs of of the American public. OK, that's that's what this has done. It, it took a broken health care system that was going to continue to screw over a large ma majority of Americans, which it was doing every single day by denying coverage, jerking coverage out from people whenever they got sick, doing all of these things. And it provided the protections for those folks there. So you didn't lose your homes uh, because you saw a spot on, the, on an X-ray somewhere. All right. And so. That those sorts of things can't be replaced and, and they're not going to be replaced. And so then you turn to what what are you going to do if you're a state like Alabama and, and saving these rural hospitals that are vital to these communities? Um, and, and they've not been able to come up with anything that outside of expanding Medicaid. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, you know, they've tried this public private partnership thing and that, that's being pitched now. It's had a little bit of success in some places. It's also had some pretty big problems in some places. So they're going to have to tweak the hell out of that, to make that yeah. work. Uh, or we could just expand Medicaid like all these other states have done and see what happened. Maybe we could fund some of the stuff. I mean, we act like we're dealing in rocket science here. What, 40 some odd other states have already done this? Do I right. totally agree with Josh. If we could pair what they're planning, you know, the Republican plan to do with rural hospitals and add the uh, expansion of Medicaid, 
it would solve a multitude of problems. Right. And it would boost the economy. Yes. It would it would help the workforce mm-hmm. and, and all those things we know. But there's been resistance to it because it was called Obamacare. Yes. And 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 this is just it has been so long ago that it's kind of crazy that we're we're still talking about it like this is a divisive uh, uh, issue because red states have expanded it. Mm-hmm. Red states that have expanded it are doing better. But we, we, we stick with the nonsense because it appeals to the lowest com- common denominator mm-hmm. of the base. Mm-hmm. But uh, another thing that uh, Alabama is looking at doing during this next legislative session is actually doing some modifications mm-hmm. to uh, uh, the gun laws. One would be outlawing bump stocks. The other would be outlawing these Glock mm-hmm. uh, switches. Mm-hmm. But mm-hmm. I don't know that you can get any serious legislation through. Uh, but, you know, it's always worth a shot. You know, the interesting thing about this one is it has bipartisan sponsorship. Right. So that gives it a, I mean, it, it's original, you know, the original sponsors are Democrats. But I think it's, uh, I can't remember who it is right now. Uh, Enzer and uh, Guang Van Gavan. Those are both the Democrats, right? They're, they're Democrats, but there's also uh, Republican sponsors on here as well, which gives it a lot more uh, possibility of actually getting somewhere in the Alabama legislature. I mean, Josh, the idea that we sell devices to turn uh, already lethal weapons into military grade weapons and, and we're okay with that does, doesn't make any sense. Have you, have you ever seen a Glock switch fire? Have you ever seen anybody fire one? Uh, it, it's it's essentially an uncontrollable weapon that fires until the clip runs out. Wow. Uh, yeah, it, uh, I, it's, I mean, we we had uh, we had the sheriff of Montgomery County, Derek Cunningham, on our podcast a few weeks back, and he sent us a video of him, an experienced lawman uh, who's shot you know thousands and thousands of weapons over the course of his career, firing one of these things with with a Glock switch on. And and he had to be first of all he had to be braced by somebody behind him. And if you've ever uh, it just I mean it, it just sprayed bullets. It's all it did yeah. was just spray bullets around. And and if you've ever seen video of of an untrained person using it, it's just wild, man. And the idea that we're still kicking this thing around two years after it was introduced by Philip Enzler yeah. uh, in, in, in the in the uh, house, it's it's nuts. I mean, what in what world? If we had devices that made cars just randomly drive into crowds of people, <laughs> we would fix the hell out of that, you know. But obviously, you say no, it's a gun, uh, and oh well, let's be careful because we don't want to. We want to make sure these people can use their guns however they want to. This is nuts, man. Fix this. Well, again, it, it is about pandering to the lowest common denominator of the base who believes that any gun mm. control whatsoever, no matter how how small it is, is intrusive to their Second Amendment. Well, where, uh, go ahead. No, go ahead. you got to finish up real quick. Uh, but the thing is, is all the five point shooting, as Josh said, that was a that was a Glock switch. Now, I've held a Glock. I've dry fired a, a Glock. Those yeah. things are heavy. Yeah. And if you've got somebody, you know, without emptying all of it, it's got to be just going everywhere, yeah. which is the result of five points. But, and she is a very good shot, by the way. Anyway, you're watching The V, the voice of Alabama politics. We'll be right back. personal biggest pet peeve is kids who are not properly restrained, whether that be in a booster seat, a car seat, or even a simple seatbelt. Kids, they become projectiles and it's terrifying. It absolutely breaks my heart to know that something so innocent could be punished so severely. Your children rely on you to be that person that says, no, you need to put your seatbelt on. Welcome back to The V, the voice of Alabama politics. Another survey that I've written about recently had to do with women in the workplace. And Alabama is 
among the worst in the Southeast for women's workforce mm -hmm. participation. Now, uh, back in 2022, the legislatures put together a group, a task force, the Alabama Workforce and Wage Gap Task Force that specifically looked at women in the workplace. And it made a lot of recommendations, Susan. But if you look through the recommendations, I don't see where there's been much or if any implementation mm -hmm. of those suggestions, which they make all the mm -hmm. sense in the world. And we talked about it in 2022 about what a great idea it was. Mm -hmm. But it seems to now just be languishing. But, I, but maybe it's not, but no one's brought it to our attention. Well, I mean, in, in 2023, only 53 percent of prime age women in Alabama were employed. And two of the biggest problems there are child care and uh, the difference in pay, um, which, you know, they go hand in hand because if you're getting paid less, then you certainly can't afford expensive right. child care. Right. And like you said, it, while they've come up with some really good ideas, I don't see where they're implementing them at this point. And Josh, again, this is one of those where we, we study a problem. That's a real problem. We come up mm -hmm. with a solution, a real solution. And then we go, oh, isn't that nice? Isn't that lovely? And do nothing. Yeah, it's a, <laughs> it's a, it's a, perfect, it's a perfect government task force right here. Well, here is a list of all of your problems. Yep. There's the list. And, and that's really it. That's the end of it. We've identified all of the all of the problems. Uh, you know, it's just uh, honestly, man, it, it it reminds me of the of the old skit with the Mel Brooks coming down from the mount with the fifteen. Clients. Yeah, yeah. You know, I have these fifteen. Uh, so here, here are your problems, and they, they just stay there. Yeah. Uh, but no, it, the, listen, child care, child care, child care, child care, child care, child. Care. All right. It, if you you fix that one problem, uh, you you provide. Uh, some sort of affordable child care, some way to make child care more affordable. You know who you know who did address this? Democrats. Uh, Anthony Daniels uh, addressed this in, in the last legislative session uh, by partnering with private businesses to give them incentives mm -hmm. to hold to, to, to make child care more available, uh, both on site and to partner with off site locations uh, to make to make their uh, child care uh, more available. To right. Folks. And uh, you know, that that's the sort of thing that puts women in the workforce, because right now you're looking at the situation. I, you know, I know from my experience, we paid more than uh, I want to say it's around thirty thousand dollars a year. Mm -hmm. for child care. Yeah. You know, and, and now we, we could afford to do that. We're very fortunate enough to, to be in a position where we could afford to do that for our daughters in a nice place uh, and have that, uh, you know, that, that bill come and go every month. But it was still a hit, you know, yeah, still a hit sure. every month. But and if you're looking at it from from a, a reasonable standpoint, let's say you're you're in the lower end of the workforce, in which most people who have young children are, they're just starting out in life. Well, hell, man, that's you know seventy five to eighty percent of your paycheck yeah, in some yeah, cases yeah. Uh, yeah. that's going to that. Where if you just stay home, you know, take a take a side gig working online somewhere, you you've made up the difference right there. You want to get people back in the workforce, right. fix that problem, and it'll go away overnight. Well, and I and I also think this this idea of Equal pay for equal work. I mean, we've been fighting over that issue forever. There is no reason in the world other than chauvinistic tendencies Absolutely. to pay a woman 75 cents on the dollar and that a man gets. I mean, Lily Ledbetter took Goodyear to court 40 years ago. It's been a long time ago. I don't know how long it's been, but it's been a while. It was in the 80s. Yeah. So that's, you know, yeah. 40 years ago. I mean, and we're still having the same problem? Yeah, I mean, it, it, it doesn't make any sense, but they do it because they can get away with it. Of course they do. Uh, and that, that's that's always the case with government uh, that is not for the people or by the people. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, it, 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 because as soon as, you know, you start taking care of people, you're going to have to figure out a way to pay for it. And mm -hmm. I get that. Mm -hmm. But when you uh, have a, a business, you want to factor in. That you're going to eat, pay everybody equally. We do not, here. That, I, you know, that's that, that, just crazy. But you know how that doesn't work. You know where that doesn't work. Where? Union shops. No, that's, that's where it doesn't work. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you, get you get you a union job. You, you guaranteed what you're going to get to pay, and it's going to be equal. Women are going to get paid the same as men. Uh, you know, it, it, the the only thing that's going to save the country as a whole for the working class folks uh, who continue to vote against themselves 
uh, it is the rise of unions, uh, the reintroduction in America of unions mm -hmm. in this country. And if we don't continue to support that and push it, uh, then we're going to be hurting. And if we do, then we're going to solve a whole lot of the problems in terms of the pay gap between men and women and in terms of the pay gap between workers and executives. Um, and that is our course of action out of, uh, of upward mobility is, is unionization. Well, uh, good luck with that uh, currently. And we'll see how that changes. But, the you know, the, the MAGA Republican Party is really uh, built on the backs of working class Americans mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, who, who want to, you know, a, a, a better life. So. Maybe there will be a sea change there as well, because the, the Democrats nationally are not doing well with union members that much. But I do want to get to this one last thing, which Susan, you and I talked about it when we were as soon as we voted. And then Josh and I talked about it and you talked about it afterwards. When we got our Alabama ballots, mm -hmm. there was maybe one or two Democrats that challenged a slew of Republicans. You only had one choice. Mm -hmm. And that was you could either vote for a Republican or you could either not you could not vote in that category. And those were judges, those were lawmakers, mm -hmm. those were all kinds of jobs in government that there was no choice. Yeah, you could either vote for the Republican or you could do a write-in. That was it. Yeah. I mean, Donald Duck. Josh, I mean, you 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 have uh, you've been around this Democratic Party a long time. They don't seem to exist on the ballot. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I had I had one choice, Greg Griffin. Yeah, uh, you know, and, and about on the ballot in, in uh, Limestone County and, and in, in Madison County, but statewide, they, they, Greg Griffin was also the yeah. Uh, you know, there were a couple of, of councilmen and uh, and commission seats, but you know, listen, it, it you 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 got to start if you want to build the party, you've got to start at the bottom. All right, nobody. <laughs> Uh, nobody's going to start out winning in this thing. You've got to build the name recognition. You've got to put people in these races. You've got to build up the donor bases. You've got to build up the volunteer bases. And the only way to do that is to put people in those places to run and get recognition and have them on the ballot so the names get into people's heads so they understand what the hell is going on in, the, in this state and that there is an option out there. Challenge people on the option. What the only real race we had in this state was Caroline Dobson versus Shamari Fisher. Yep. Okay, and in that race, Caroline Dobson came out and said that she wished that that Governor Ivey and the legislature would explore Medicaid expansion yep. in the state. And it was because there was a close race, and people came out and challenged their positions on these things, and they had to start taking a look at the majority and what the majority. Does. We're gonna have to leave it right there. Unfortunately, we continue to have sad news. Uh, Jimmy Holly, long-standing uh, senator, uh, some forty odd years in the legislature, has passed away. Also, Tammy Teague, who was the wife of John Teague, a former senator, they were both lobbyists. She was a fixture in Montgomery and one of the most dear people you would ever want to meet. They sadly have left us, and they will be missed. <laughs>